I look at job descriptions as you want the right people to be attracted and you want to repel everybody else. And so, you know, you should build your values language into that job description. And you should start out with uncovering what might be a potential theme for that person. Because if I want somebody to read my big long list of crap, sorry, like that's really what it is, then I, I've got to draw them in. And, um, you know, you're in marketing, right, Thomas? If, if you put out content for one of your clients that put the job description, what do you think would be the end result? Uh, a very low conversion rate. Yeah, and you'd probably get fired. Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the episode today, we have Rick Girard. Rick, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Thomas. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. It is very much my pleasure. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Uh, so my name is Rick Gerard. I am a, um, I'm an executive search professional, also a startup founder. Um, I authored my first book called Healing Career Wounds last year. And I also host a radio show and podcast called Higher Power Radio. And it's it's not a religious show. It's actually H-I-R-E. So it's everything. I'm all things hiring. That's my, that's my shtick. Okay. Well, um, I'm, I definitely um, think that this will be of benefit to me at very least. So um, I, I'm happy to have you on the show. Um, Thank you. Of all the sort of advice that people ask you for regarding hiring, what do you lead with? You know, I always lead with uh, hiring for core values first. Um, and a specific example of, of, of success for that is, is going back to probably the largest, most successful company in the world, Amazon. Uh, Amazon makes uh, about 75% of the hiring decision is based on whether or not you align with their core values. So if they've done it so right for so long, why are we all doing it so wrong so often, right? Um, they don't, the skills piece is, they've realized that the skills piece is important, but it's not as important as whether or not somebody aligns with who your organ, like the DNA of your organization, like the way in which you run and operate the company is far more important that people align with that than whether or not they have five years of this or four years of that. So um, how would you go about, let's say, determining whether someone aligns with your values or not? Uh, the best tool for that is behavioral interviewing questions. So if you're not familiar with behavioral interview questions, basically um, they sometimes get confused with situational questions. Like, you know, if you had a situation like this, how would you handle it? That's a situational question. And you can kind of fudge through it. A behavioral question gives evidence to support whether or not somebody acts in that manner. So tell me about a time you experienced this or walk me through a time you did this. And you kind of create these scenarios. Everybody in their professional experience, even their life, have, have had challenges. You know, walk me through a time somebody asked you to lie. We've all been asked to lie by somebody at some point in our life, right? Um, these things give you a lot of really good evidence and insight as to how a person uh, reacts to those and actually acts to those scenarios. And, um, and then you just measure those as to how well they align with the goals and the values of your company. Um, I, I always kind of joke around like, you know, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Enron, but you know, it was a big scandal here years ago and their number one core value is integrity, right? Um, which we all know that wasn't really the case. Um, the, the, and the reason why I bring that up is because you really need to spend a little bit of time and understand what your values are. And they have to be true. They can't just be words on a wall like most companies have. You know, I walk into offices all the time and they'll say integrity and, you know, confidence and teamwork and all these other things. And those are really nice to have those words on the wall. But, you know, what your values are or how people act within the company. And then, you know, taking it a step further, you know, building those values into your decision, your daily decision making, how you run the company based on those values. Uh, I think, um, you know, Amazon does a really good job of this too. Like their number one principle is customer obsession. 
So as they're making decisions, is this, are we, are we showing that we're obsessed with what our customer wants? I do want to ask you about um, the company values, uh, but I do have sort of a question around whether or not, so with, with this type of advice, it makes me think um, that, you know, you, you're much higher, higher probability to get someone um, better or better for your company yeah. at least. Um, but how much can you avoid a bad hire, would you say? Well, um, we've been running this like with a lot of our clients for the past eight years. And, you know, we do this at an executive search level. And now we're building out a software solution to be able to scale so that really any company can be able to do this. But we've got companies operating at a 98% plus success rate. We've got one company that hasn't made a bad hire in five and a half years. And everybody that they've been bringing on have been really, really strong A players who are thriving in the environment. And they're very protective of that ecosystem now because the productivity in the company is through the roof. And, and it's showing in their profitability. So um, you can 100% avoid bad hires by, by hiring this way. You know, by, by really oh, not going to 98%. For yeah, or 98%. Yeah, sure. <laughs> 98%, I think someone would take that if they were, uh, if they were hiring. I think most um, people would take 70%, like would be, you know, they'd be ecstatic about that. Because, you know, statistically, you actually have a 51% chance if you don't have a hiring process and you're not really, like, you're just, you have a 51% chance that the hire that you make is the wrong hire. So you're better off sometimes just walking into a room, flipping the coin, heads your tail, <laughs> you know, you're hired and tails you're not. Have you got thoughts on number of interviews? Well, yeah, I do because you know the interview process should be should be lined up to where uh, whoever's kind of doing the work in the front end is saving the time for the people on the back end, right? Because it, you want to you want to keep your people who are productive you know, in productive positions, like you want to keep them working. You don't want to be lining up 15 interviews for every position that you have to fill. That's it's ridiculous. Um, you know, we operate at a, a three to one interview to placement ratio, which means most of our clients that we work with, we're like two and a half to three people that we present and one hire, which is highly efficient because you're keeping all of your people productive and they're not having to spend a whole bunch of time talking to people who, who wouldn't have made it anyway. You know, they find out at the tail end that, oh, shoot, well, this guy's really not, you know, aligning with our values or this person's not really, um, you know, wanting to go to a company that's like our size company. They really want a large company or a startup, you know, but they've invested all this time now and they're kind of stuck. So you want to know all that stuff up front. And that can all be uh, experienced in that first discovery call, um, which is usually a 10 minute call. And that's where you get all the rich data. If you spend the time asking the right questions and gathering like the evidence to support whether or not somebody's even aligned with the company or not. So you're generally opposed to, should we say, interviewing large quantities of, of people for a role? If you have one role, you only need to really theoretically interview one person. I mean, that's 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 really the truth. So, like, why should you interview a whole bunch of people? And I think the reason why we have been programmed to interview a bunch of people and we want more people in the funnel is because we want we want to take this position of compare and contrast people. But again, there, it's because there's no north star as to how you're evaluating people. You're just going off of gut and bias. And whatever feelings you have or your personal motives, as opposed to going after like what's important, does this person, is this like, am I evaluating this one person to the best of my ability to make sure that they fit our organization? Interesting stuff. So um, coming back, like we said about the company's values, you referenced um, words on the wall. Presumably yeah. because, I mean, I think in some instances, a lot of companies don't know or haven't decided what their values are. And if they have, they're not congruent with it. So what yeah. are your thoughts around this topic? Um, I think it doesn't take very much time to sit down in a room with your leadership team and really determine who we are. How do we make decisions? What's important to the organization as we grow and how do we hire people that align with those that 
the mission, vision, value, and more importantly, the, the DNA of who we are as a company. And it all comes down from the CEO, really, because if you look at most companies, um, man, I've, I've walked into companies, I walked into one company one time, it was, um, I was invited in and behind the wall of the CEO, uh, behind his desk, had like words like integrity and like, uh, you know, all the buzzwords that everybody's kind of using today. Teamwork. Teamwork was the one I keyed in on. So we had a pretty decent conversation. He walked me around the operation and I noticed as I was going through that people were getting really loud on their keyboards as like he, heard, he was being heard walking through and there was no teamwork, no collaboration. People were just all siloed. And so when we went back to his office, I said, well, can I ask you a question about your core values? He said, yeah. I go, where did you get them? He goes, oh, well, we, we, um, we had a team meeting and I thought they sounded really well, like really good. So we decided to make those our values. So it's important that, you know, like, you know, that those are aspirational values, but there's no action behind making those values, bringing those values to fruition. Um, it's just words on a wall. And, and, the people who work there understand that when there's just words on a wall and, and, and it's not lived from the top down, then essentially you're, you're, um, you're killing your credibility as a leader. And then you're just creating probably the most dysfunctional environment that you, that you can because nobody believes you. So how much um, do you think it should be um, our values are what we do? Um, or what we aspire to be, because I think in some instances people, like for example, if if you had a company and they were let's say highly highly money driven, um, maybe you think they should have that on the wall. Maybe I don't know, but yeah, um, if it is the case that they are that way, should they own it or should they aspire to be something that they want to do? They should own it. That's who they are. I think where companies get into trouble is they try to hire people for these aspirational values who um, who don't allow, like who who are are sold one kind of a utopian environment and they come in and they're thrown to the wolves. I mean, you should be upfront about the fact that we're a bunch of backstabbing whatever, and and you know it's you're not going to get any attention until you you prove yourself. I mean, these are things. There's a lot of environments, hunter environments are like that, right? Where you eat what you kill. And, and that should probably be their value. You know, don't, don't say teamwork and collaboration are your values when they're really not. Okay. And um, coming back to interviewing for a moment, because um, I think I bet based on your expertise in this particular area, you've come across some of the worst quote unquote mistakes um yes can you should we should we highlight what those are and perhaps why they're why they're mistakes well okay so first and foremost not having an interview structure is is a death sentence for a company um you know you you want to provide an experience for candidates we're we're in a world right now where uh you as a company do not control the process you do, and, and I mean, you do not make the decision. The, 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 the talent is choosing where to go because they have lots of options. And so you have to, and it's not a, we're not in an environment where you need to sell somebody. We're, we're in an environment where you need to show that you provide value to them above and beyond just that paycheck. Because if you're fighting this transactional paycheck game, you're going to lose every time. Uh, there's always somebody with a much better wallet. And, um, you know, candidates are, are getting four, five, six offers, especially the ones who are even maybe even 10 offers, especially the ones that are active. But, you know, when you, when you have somebody in the process, you kind of have to treat them like it doesn't matter where they came from or how you found them. You have to treat them like they're your only candidate and give them an experience in which they're going to be able to shine. And, you know, and it should be congruent with whatever your environment is. If you have a high stress environment, then provide that stress. Don't try and hide anything. You know, give them a really accurate snapshot of the good, the bad, and the ugly of the company. Because uh, I found that, you know, when, when you sell just a, a, like this utopian environment, and everybody knows 
There's no such thing. Like you might have a great looking company, but you're probably like a prom queen. You're probably like beautiful on the outside, but a hot mess internally, right? So at best, you're that. So just, you know, be open and honest with it. And, and high performers are drawn to that. They want to solve problems. They want to be part of the solution as opposed to kind of coming into something that they think, well, I'm just going to be filling a slot. And so um, that, that's the, the most important thing. And then like as you're, as you're interviewing people, um, you've got to coordinate. You can't just uh, bring people in for an interview and, and just like ad hoc it. You can't just like have conversations and have no direction because what you're doing is you're demonstrating to, to this person, this is how we run our company. We don't really have any structure. We don't really know what we're doing. We're just trying to figure it out. And, and if you want to get rid of a, a really high performer or somebody who's really good or probably the best hire that you can get, then, then show them or demonstrate to them that you have no idea what you're doing. You know, What's they, an example of a structure in that instance? Well, okay, so a structure should be uh, that you have a, an actual written down process. It should be timed. And it should be laid out. Like we, when we um, put somebody through the interview process, we tell them what each step of the process is, how much time it's going to take. And, you, you know, you always start on time and end on time. Um, and then uh, when you take somebody through an interview, we, we do something like the interviews are usually behavioral based. And each interviewer is provided the questions because we don't we want to control the process and make it as fair as possible and repeatable for everybody. So that, you know, you're eliminating bias as much as possible. And I know that's a kind of a nice utopian buzzword today, but, but it does come into play very heavily within every interview process. You know, uh, people see people as threats or they might have personal motives. And so they just cut people out of the loop or they make decisions really quickly. And then they spend the rest of that time trying to justify that decision. So we, we want to do is we want to, these behavioral questions to um, to gather evidence that that supports underneath the hood whether or not somebody should make uh, a positive or negative decision on whether or not to hire somebody. And again, you're challenging people in such a way where people get impressed by this process because of the fact that it's unlike what everybody else is doing. There's nothing more unimpressive or demotivating for a candidate than talking to four different people at the same company and getting asked the same question three different times. So um, as to summarize the answer, um, we've got have <laughs> a structured a long process. Way, huh? No, no, I don't, I don't mind. I'm just, uh, it's for me more than anything. It's yeah. um, tell them when it starts, uh, how long it will be, tell them when it ends, um, tell the truth and um, mitigate against biases. And also, I'm missing one. And yeah, and then and then oh, the last thing, and I didn't really mention it, but prepare people for the interview. Let them know what to expect. I mean, there's no reason to hide what you do. Um, I want somebody to come in and be able to fail on their own or shine on their own. And so, uh, I actually provide people the interview questions, and I don't I don't give them the context of what I'm evaluating them against, and I don't give them the sub questions that I built out. You know that. That kind of I use during the conversation, but I do I allow them to prepare. If they come prepared, then then you know that they're taking it seriously. And if they don't, then you know pretty quickly that they're not a fit for your company. Unless and, um, that's not important to you. <laughs> it should be though, well, because you don't want to succeed, right? Definitely. Um, I think it's a it's a big investment, which is why I think companies can fall into that let's try and interview as many people as we can and put them through as you said 15 interviews is because it is a big deal to companies um and, yeah. but as you say um there is a way to be more efficient with that um yeah. your, your example was um the phone interview beforehand um is there anything that you can highlight which would um indicate that they're going to be a, a good person to interview or perhaps um, someone you don't want to interview. Yeah, so uh, there's kind of three pillars to it. Um, you want somebody who, like, what I'm looking for in a phone conversation is 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 
uh, two things. How is this person positioned? Meaning, uh, what is it that they want out of their career? Because if I fit that, they're going to probably do well in my organization. If I don't, then there's no sense in me bringing them through an interview process. And then I also want to know how good a person is. Um, I, you know, I spent most of my career screening candidates and sending them over to candidate to companies and then kind of hoping the hiring manager would like them. And I could never really, like, it was difficult for me to provide value because I didn't really know if somebody was good. I just knew that they had the buzzwords that the company was looking for. And so um, flipping that around and understanding, okay, so what is this person's pain first and foremost? Why are they looking? Somebody has to have a legitimate reason for looking uh, above and beyond, well, you know what, I heard it's a good job market and I can make a lot more money. That's not really a pain. That's a, I'm gonna take your offer and shop it back to my company and get a higher offer so I don't have to leave, right? Um, and then, uh, what it is they desire is the second piece. So people will tell you in that first conversation, what it is they want to do, because it's a very non-threatening conversation. They're not in an interview process and it should be done before you sell them your company or your job or any of those sort of things. They should, they should be able to unpack what it is that they want to do, what their vision for success is, what the type environment that they're going to do well in, right? And so if they're painting a picture that sounds like your company, now you've, you're on the right track. If it's completely off, you know, I've had people who said, you know, in an ideal scenario, I want a big comp package with, you know, lots of time off working in a large company where I just kind of do my work and go home. And if you're a startup again or a smaller company, that ain't going to work. So you just saved everybody down the path a lot of time by not bringing that person in for an interview. And then finally, like I want to delve into what it is that they've done that's impacted the organization. So we all know, we've all heard of the terms like A, B, and C player, right? Um, a players or people who are really strong at what they do, they know exactly what they did and how they did it. So um, we target something above and beyond their current job that they've accomplished uh, within the organization that might have saved time, increased revenue gain recognition, uh, or solve a really difficult problem. Something that um, put them at the forefront or, or you know, brought them to the top. Again, A players look for opportunities to make an impact within the organization. So me being able to extract that information in that first phone call allows me to take that person to my hiring manager and say, hey, look, at, I'm setting up an interview for this person because this person did this, 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 and this. And they were able to build this for the company. And this was the result. And that just those three pieces eliminates a lot of people, depending on kind of where your, your um, company is. Now, at scale, it totally, you know, again, it, it still works if you've got 50 positions that you need to, that you need to run. Um, you just have this conversation. Again, you're going to have a bigger funnel of people coming in. But it's really easy to kind of just read through those people with a quick conversation. A lot of people fall out at the first, second question. And then you can just, you know, the ones that make it through, it's as short as a five minute conversation and you go 45 minutes to an hour. But, you know, those 45 minutes to an hour conversations are all really, really good, valuable conversations that allow that person to really see the value in joining your organization. And guess Thank what? There is a big problem with people not showing up for interviews. This is how you get people to solve, to show up for interviews. Spending the time up front, you know, just calling them up and saying, "Hey, we like your background. We'd like to invite you in for an interview." There's no, there's no emotional connection. There's no reason for them to show up, and especially if you're asking them about comp issues right up front, and then you're complaining about their comp being too high. So um, <laughs> essentially, you're um, influencing the turn up rate um, by just yeah. having a, a, a quick phone call. And the would you say that the biggest thing that you like to lead with is what it is that they want and therefore it disqualifies people who aren't relevant for the position? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, because again, if, if, if what you offer is not what they want, they're just really taking the job for the paycheck. And when something else better comes along, they're going to leave. Hmm. Any thoughts on um, biggest mistakes with job descriptions? 
<laughs> oh man, uh, don't get me started on job descriptions. You know, they should be written like a marketing document. They're not. Um, I, you know, they're, you know, it's all about, most job descriptions are all about me, right? And so your audience, you have to think about who you want to attract. You want everybody who's looking for any job on the internet to apply, or do you want that person who might go home at, you know, at the end of the day, who's not really looking for a job, but they're like, oh, you know, I'll check out what's on the various job boards. And I go, hmm, this looks interesting. Oh, that, that has some meat to it. All right, I'll, I'll apply to that. Um, I don't think much thought goes into the job description from the perspective it's all about like, we're looking for this and you must have these requirements and to work here, we're awesome. You, you know, it's just a, it's a bunch of, let me just tell you more about me. You know that person that you probably know in your life who you, you have a conversation with and like, okay, that's great. Let me tell you more about me. That's what a job description is most of the time. And, and so if you flip it around and make it around about that person that you want to attract, then uh, then they're going to lean in, they're going to respond, and you're going to you're, you're going to have a much better result. So I look at job descriptions as you want the right people to be attracted, and you want to repel everybody else. And so you know you should build your values language into that job description, and you should start out with uncovering what might be a potential pain for that person. Because if I want somebody to read my big long list of crap, sorry, like that's really what it is, um, then uh, then I, I've got to draw them in. And um, you know, you're in marketing, right, Thomas? If if you put out content for one of your clients that looked like a job description, what do you think would be the end result? Uh, a very low conversion rate. Yeah, and you'd probably get fired. So, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, because I, I don't know about you, but I, I cringe every time I see a job description. Because I get clients that send me over a job description, and then I totally gut it and rebuild it up because I, I really like I, you can't put that stuff out there and and expect to attract the right people. And then I, we we put a call to action at the end of it. Um, if somebody's gonna if somebody's gonna apply, then we give them a, an outlet. Like we will call you for sure. If you answer these three questions, if you don't, then please don't expect a, a reply from us. And it's just that simple. It's interesting because um, initially I thought the pre-qualifying began with the phone call, but actually it's, it's pre-qualifying in the job description and then uh, discounting people who don't fit the criteria in the phone call. And then that's mm -hmm. how you end up with your very small pool of, um, should we say, good candidate candidates yeah. for interview, right? Yeah, yeah. And ultimately, like if I'm a hiring manager, I just want I just want the best people. I mean, quite frankly, uh, is, as long as you're giving them an avenue to, hey, like I've got two really good people, like they're both A players, you know, so interview these two, tell me which one you want to hire. Um, yeah, that's ultimately what what I want. That's ultimately what most hiring managers want. They don't want to, like, you know, if you ask anybody if they like hiring and interviewing, I get nine, nine out of 10 times you get people going, oh, I hate, I hate interviewing. I hate hiring because I'm not good at it. You know, I just don't enjoy it. It takes up so much of my time. So make it fun. You mentioned um, A players. Um, I once had a conversation about, should we say, hi, what type of person you want to hire and meaning uh, high performers versus people who are going to stick around for a long time. Like, which one should you choose? Have you got any thoughts there? Well, I mean, you want a combination of both, really. Um, you want somebody who's a high performer who wants to stick around, and the way that you get them to stick around is to career path them. Um, in our efforts as we're recruiting people, the ones that are sticking at their current companies are the ones who have a plan with their company, and their company like is really fostering their growth. That's what we're seeing right now. Um, you know, there, there's, um, there was an old kind of saying about training, like what if I train people and they leave? And then the other one was, well, the opposite of that would be, what if you don't train them and they stay? Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of, it is the chicken and the egg. I mean, you want a really good combination of both. Um, people, you know, 
it's not necessarily good for growth to have somebody who's just going to stick it out who's just going to be, um, you know, doing their job. It just really depends on the role and the function and how how critical those people are into the organization. If it's an admin or somebody like that, it's not as critical to the growth. Then, you know, that's that's kind of a personal preference. But if it's somebody who's pretty critical to the the growth of the company, then you really have to focus on providing both. For them. Okay. So if it's so sorry, I can't give you a, I can't give you a, I can't choose sides. I'm on the middle on that one. <laughs> well, I've, I've given you a very complex question, and I want a very simple answer. That's the, uh, I, that's the summary there. But, yeah. Um, in in your uh, your profile, um, you reference the Great Resignation. This is, I feel, a a bit of a buzzword at the moment. Um, yeah. From my perspective, a bit skeptical, but um, I would like you know for for those that don't know. Um, would you like to go into what it is and what you think about it? Sure. So, um, you know, I think most of it kind of occurred in 2021, like last year. A lot of people, especially like first and second quarter of last year, jumped ship. I mean, the job numbers, um, I think every, a lot of people stuck it out during the whole first year of COVID or the pandemic because they wanted that safety net. Um, that time gave a lot of people the opportunity to think about like, what is it that I really want? Because I'm, I'm spending time with my family. Some people that was good. Some people that was bad. I don't know. But I, I think people really took that time and they really evaluated what they wanted out of their careers. So a, a lot of people jumped ship. Um, and um, as a result, the companies that didn't treat their people very well lost a lot of people. And they've been scrambling to get more people on. And so it, it is a real thing from the perspective of, you know, I think back in January, I heard that there was, we operate in the U.S. at between like five and six billion job postings a, a, a month. And I think we were at 11 million and change job postings. So like there's just been this big flux of people that are hiring and it's driving up everything. And I think a lot of people are still sitting on the sidelines or they're doing their own thing or they found other ways in which they can make income or they just retired and said, I don't want, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Um, so for whatever reason, um, I, I, I think it's like more of the great reset. Somebody else coined that. I did not make it up, but, but I, I think it's more of that than I, and I've seen a lot of companies get gutted and I've seen a lot of them. Or quite a few companies that have just been people centric and they've done a great job of keeping their people engaged and and they're not leaving so and they're the ones who are by the way stealing all the people from the other companies <laughs> <laughs> well you put a couple of qualifiers on there which i think are um it makes complete sense which is um if you have an employer who doesn't treat you very well um and you get some time to think about that then, I mean, it's a completely logical decision to go to yeah. attempt to go somewhere else, right? So, um, Absolutely. and like you said, um, if you do have a good employer who perhaps cares about your, I don't know, your well being or your happiness to some degree, then do you think that that employer would be somewhat immune to the, something like the great res resignation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think they're totally immune because I think, you know, some employers do better with some, you know, some employees. But also, I think uh, if you have people that really aren't aligned with the values of the company and, you know, whether or not you write them down, your company has values. You know, the way in which you operate are your values. And, they, you know, it kind of filters up to what the culture is. The people who don't align with that culture, or those values have gone and found other places, too. But it's probably been good for those companies that that have done a good job because they've been able to kind of keep the people that are critical to the organization and they'd be able to supplement other people in that that align well with the organization as well. We have focused a lot um, from the business perspective, uh, which is, I mean, logical given the fact that most of the audience is is business owners but have you got any thoughts on the other end of the table so the the person applying or interviewing for that job what do you have any advice for them you know and i do because i, I think uh people don't understand how much um how much value they have right now and if you're having a difficult time 
finding a job right now, it's because you're you, you're taking the wrong approach. And and so you know, I have come across quite a few people that have been looking for jobs, and they're just I've sent out a hundred resumes through the job boards, and um, you know I haven't been able to get interviews. Well, there, there's two big problems with that. Number one, spray and pray doesn't work, right? And that's really what you're doing. If you don't like getting calls from telemarketers, don't send your resume out to every other company, right? Um, target five companies that you really want to work for, and then think about why you want to work for them, and then become your own recruiter. Like if you have a recruiter who has a relationship with them, you can utilize them. But I found what works really well is to um, you, you kind of have to do this. Uh, Little, I don't want to call it a game, but you kind of have to play the, the the mindset of kind of where things are. If you come across as being desperate or looking for a job or, or you ask somebody for a job, uh, they always filter you down to the HR department. Um, if you really found a company that you want to work for, LinkedIn is a great resource. Find out who would be your hiring manager, who would be the person you'd be working for. And then just reach out to them. Don't tell them you're looking for a job, but tell them that you found their company. You found it really interesting and the work challenging and, you know, like it's something that really resonated with you and say, hey, I'm not lo really looking for a job right now. I'm kind of open, but I'd like to have coffee with you or get to know you for the future for when time you, when you might be able to use somebody talented. Um, I've seen a lot of people that I've kind of, talked that through that have gotten great results and gotten hired pretty quickly by just doing what everybody else is not doing. Um, I, my um, interpretation of that is like personalization. So you referred yeah. to the fact that everyone's just sending out a hundred uh, CVs, but really what you should do is pick very carefully and do a, do a very good job of just dealing with a small number. Yeah, and this is probably where I'm going to get hate mail from HR people because it's like circumventing the process, right? But, you know, um, the, when you have a, a flow of, when, when you come from the top, I mean, the bottom up, you know, where uh, it's so hard to get up to the top. But when you start from the top and then the, the hiring manager says, hey, I want to bring this person in for an interview, you just circumvented all that clutter, all, that, all those hurdles that have been put up to screen people out. So, you know, why would you want to play the same game that everybody else is playing? It just, it results in frustration, you know, and no job. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think you've given some amazing answers. So I really appreciate the value. Um, what you. does success mean to you? Um, for me, success is elevating those around me. I mean, I, I'm all about, um, I'm a startup guy and I'm a builder. And I love seeing companies that I work with. like. Uh, be able to bring in somebody who really makes an impact and 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 watching them grow, and that that's like you know my I'm rewarded in other ways, but like I get so much satisfaction from seeing people that I work with grow. So using that criteria, are you successful? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody I say love, no? <laughs> love the straightforward, um, straightforward <laughs> answer. So some people hesitate. I think that there's a. Uh, you know, should I say I'm successful? Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a tricky thing to work around. But um, if you got, my opinion is, if you've got high self-esteem and you've got your own definition of what success is, then um, yeah, the answer should be yes, really. Yeah, it should be hell yes, right? Like, yeah. So, uh, what are your goals, Rick? Well, my goal right now, I'm really focusing on building um, a SaaS platform that um, we can get this, our, our, what we call a hiring and operating system out to every small company out there. Like I, I'm a big proponent of, like, again, like I said, I'm a startup person. I want to see small companies thrive. And, you know, often we don't know about how to run an interview or we don't know how to do really any of these things that attract the strongest people to us. So I want to give uh, the opportunity to all these small businesses to be able to plug into a hiring operating system that can just run their whole hiring process through and be able to, with a pretty high level of certainty, 
attract the people that they need in their business for them to thrive. So that's my goal right now. Yeah. And this is higher OS, yeah? Yeah, so higher OS is the hiring operating system. Uh, the company that we just launched, I can't tell you the name yet, but we're operating under stealth mode. <laughs> but it uh, looks like we'll, we'll, we'll probably have, um, we'll probably have our MVP of our product running in Q3. So like if anybody's interested and they wanna get on our beta um, list, they can send me an email. And uh, which country is that for? Um, we're launching in the U.S. first, but we're gonna go global, baby. Like, I want to be able to help. You know, I want to be able to help people in Antarctica. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. uh, it's a big goal, and um, yeah, good luck with it. Um, Thank you. Have, is there anything that I should have asked you about today? Uh, how do I get my head so shiny? <laughs> I, if I'd have asked you that, do you what would you have said? Coconut oil. <laughs> I just put some on my head today just because like I, I, I'm peeling. I was in the sun a couple of days ago. All right. Well, um, if people want to connect with you and uh, maybe find out more about Higher OS, where do they go? Uh, yeah. So you can uh, find my website at um, stride, S-T-R-I-D-E, search, S-E-A-R-C-H.com. You can uh, drop me a quick email at rick at stridesearch.com. I'm kind of slow at getting back, so please have some patience. I, I, I get a lot of I get a lot of email. Um, I have a book that's on Amazon. It's called um, Healing Career Wounds, and it's written for startup companies. And as a matter of fact, we uh, we're fortunate enough to get Gino Wickman from Traction his endorsement. And then, of course. Um, you can check out my podcast at Higher Power Radio, and that's H-I-R-E, PowerRadio.com. You're a busy man. I'm just trying to keep up with you, Thomas. <laughs> how's, the, uh, how's the writing process? You know, for me, it was a bit uh, tricky because I ha I, I'm not a person who can focus on one thing. I'm a total entrepreneur where I chase purple squirrels. So the way I tricked my brain is I got up every morning at 4.30. I kept all the lights off. I turned on my computer. I just, um, I read the last paragraph and then I just start writing. And then I hired a really good developmental editor to fix my dribble. <laughs> well, um, you are, you're a high achiever, right? You know what? It's funny. I, I guess I am, but I, I've never felt like I'm a high achiever. I just feel like I have more that I have to do. Okay, more to do. Yeah. Well, um, yep. for all, for everyone listening, uh, please review the links in the description. And Rick, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Thomas. I really appreciate it.